June 1944. A British bomb falls through darkness over France. It drops for 37 seconds, accelerating to near supersonic velocity, approaching 750 miles per hour. When it strikes the hillside above the Sumia railway tunnel, it does not explode on contact. Instead, it punches through 60 feet of solid earth and detonates inside the tunnel itself. The blast creates what engineer Barnes Wallace called a camoufle, an underground cavern that swallows the railway line whole. German panzer reinforcements expected to use that route face significant delay, and Britain had just unveiled a weapon that makes concrete bunkers, battleships, and fortified positions collapse from earthquakes underground. The tall boy was not simply a bigger bomb, it was a completely different theory of destruction, and by the time the war ended, it had achieved what thousands of tons of conventional explosives could not. To understand why the tall boy existed, you need to understand what it was designed to kill. By 1943, Germany had learned that conventional bombing could be survived. They built submarine pens with reinforced concrete roofs up to 7.5 metres thick. They constructed V-weapon bunkers beneath 25 feet of layered concrete and steel. They anchored their last battleship, the 52,600-ton Tirpitz, in Norwegian fjords surrounded by smoke generators and anti-aircraft batteries. RAF Bomber Command had thrown everything at these targets. Thousands of sorties, tens of thousands of tons of high explosive. The results were, according to official assessments, often limited. The problem was physics. Conventional bombs detonated on contact with their targets. The blast wave expanded outward through air, losing energy rapidly with distance. Against thick concrete, most of that energy simply bounced back. A 12,000-pound HC bomb, the famous cookie or blockbuster, contained 9,000 pounds of explosive but was designed with thin walls specifically to maximise blast effect. It could flatten city blocks. But against a fortified U-boat pen, it barely scratched the surface. Barnes Wallace saw a different solution. What if, instead of trying to punch through concrete from above, you attack the foundations from below? Shockwaves travel through solid ground far more efficiently than through air. A bomb detonating deep underground beside a structure would transmit enormous force directly into the foundations. The earth itself would become the weapon. Remove the ground beneath a bunker, and the bunker collapses into the void. Wallace called this the trapdoor effect, or more grimly the hangman's drop. The concept required a bomb unlike anything that existed. It needed to penetrate deep into earth or concrete before detonating. That meant extreme velocity at impact, which meant dropping from very high altitude. It meant a hardened steel casing that could survive smashing through reinforced structures without breaking apart. And it meant a streamlined shape that would remain stable during a fall of several miles. Wallace presented his earthquake bomb theory to the Air Ministry in March 1941. They rejected it as fantasy. His original proposal called for a 10-ton bomb dropped from 40,000 feet by an aircraft that did not exist. The supporting Victory Bomber concept, a massive six-engine strategic bomber, was dismissed alongside the weapon it would carry. Within Vickers, Wallace faced similar resistance. One colleague told him to stop playing the fool and do something useful for the war. The breakthrough came on the night of May 16-17, 1943. Wallace's bouncing bomb breached the Myrna and Eda dams during Operation Chastise. Air Chief Marshal Arthur Harris, who had previously called Wallace's ideas tripe of the wildest description, reportedly told the engineer after the raid that now he could sell him a pink elephant. Within two months, the Air Ministry issued requirements for what would become the Tall Boy. The weapon that emerged measured 21 feet in length with a diameter of 38 inches. The casing was high, tensile chromium molybdenum steel, cast as a single piece. Wall thickness exceeded four inches at the hardened nose tapering along the body. This was inverted design logic, where the cookie devoted 75% of its weight to explosive, the Tall Boy sacrificed capacity for penetration filling only 43% with explosive material. That explosive was 5,200 pounds of Torpex, a mixture of 42% RDX, 40% TNT, and 18% powdered aluminium. According to Admiralty Research, Torpex delivered 50% more destructive force than TNT by weight. The aluminium extended the explosive pulse duration, amplifying underground shockwave effects. Each bomb required up to a month for the Torpex to cool and set because the molten explosive had to be poured by hand into upturned casings, then allowed to solidify slowly to prevent cracking. The distinctive aerodynamic shape solved early prototype problems. Initial test drops saw bombs tumbling wildly during descent, 
arriving nose up or sideways with predictably poor results. Wallace designed an elongated ogive nose with tail fins offset at precisely 5 degrees from the vertical axis. This offset induced a spin of approximately 300 revolutions per minute during the fall, creating gyroscopic stability that ensured the hardened nose struck first. Dropped from the optimal 18,000 feet, the bomb fell for 37 seconds and reached terminal velocity exceeding 750 miles per hour. Only specially modified Lancasters could carry this weapon. The Lancaster B Mark I Special required extensive modification. Engineers installed bulged bomb bay doors to clear the distinctive tail fins. They removed cockpit armor plating and the mid-upper gun turret to save weight. Uprated Rolls-Royce Merlin. Mark 24 engines with paddle-bladed propellers provided additional power. Strengthened undercarriage handled the increased takeoff weight of approximately 68,500 pounds. The precision bombing requirement was equally demanding. Earthquake effect only worked if bombs landed close to targets. 617 Squadron employed the SABS, the Stabilized Automatic Bomb Sight, Mark IIa, a tachymetric precision instrument with two stabilizing gyroscopes, and a mechanical computer that calculated wind drift, ground speed, and bomb fall time simultaneously. According to squadron records, SABS-equipped bomb aimers were routinely reported to place weapons within 100 yards of targets from 15,000 feet. Standard Mark 14 sights averaged errors of 300 yards under similar conditions. Now before we see how this performed in combat, if you are enjoying this deep dive into British engineering, hit subscribe. It takes a second, costs nothing, and helps the channel grow. All right, let us get into the combat record. The Saumir Tunnel Raid on June 8th to 9th 1944 was just the beginning. The real test came against the targets that had resisted everything else. The V-weapon bunkers presented massive concrete fortifications with roofs up to 7.5 metres thick. At La Coupole near Wizun, a V-2 launch facility, 4,300 tonnes of conventional bombs had produced what reconnaissance assessed as little effect. On June 24th and July 17th, 1944, Tallboys struck the site. Bombs that failed to penetrate the dome attacked from underneath instead, undermining foundations and shifting the massive concrete structure out of alignment. The Germans abandoned the bunker without ever launching a rocket from it. At Mimoyex, home to the secret Vi-3 supergun battery, 16 Lancasters from 617 Squadron delivered eight tall boys on July 6, 1944. The earthquake effect collapsed tunnels, flooded galleries, and reportedly entombed hundreds of forced laborers underground. The site never fired a single shot. At Syracor, three direct hits destroyed the Vivon storage bunker. The pattern repeated across northern France. Structures specifically designed to survive conventional bombing proved fatally vulnerable to attacks on their foundations. The ultimate test was Tirpitz. Germany's last battleship had survived multiple carrier strikes, midget submarine attacks, and conventional bombing raids. Her armoured protection had shrugged off everything thrown at it. The Tallboy offered something different. Not simply a bigger blast, but deep penetration followed by catastrophic structural failure. Operation Paravane on September 15, 1944, saw 27 Lancasters from 9 and 617 squadrons staged from Yagodnik Airfield in the Soviet Union because the ship was beyond range from British bases. According to post-raid assessment, a single tallboy passed through the foredeck, exited below the waterline, and detonated underwater. The explosion wrecked the bow and flooded forward compartments with 2,000 tons of seawater. Near-miss detonations buckled hull plates and destroyed machinery. German naval assessors declared Tirpitz unseaworthy, requiring nine months of repairs that would never be completed. Operation Obviate on October 29th failed when clouds obscured the target at the critical moment. 32 tall boys missed, though one near-miss bent a propeller shaft. Operation Catechism on November 12th, 1944, achieved what years of conventional attacks could not. 29 tall boys fell on the anchored battleship, Two or three struck directly. One hit between turrets Anton and Bruno but failed to detonate. Another struck amidships and tore a massive hole in the port side, destroying the armoured belt entirely. A third hit turret Caesar and started fires that reached the magazine. The near misses proved equally important. They had cratered the seabed beneath the ship, removing a protective sandbank that German engineers had positioned to prevent capsizing. Tirpitz listed 60 degrees to port, then rolled over completely. Between 940 and 1204 German sailors died. Sources vary on the exact figure. Flying officer Dougie Tweddle of 9 Squadron was credited with the killing blow, though both squadrons claimed the victory. 
post-war Royal Navy investigation concluded that few conventional weapons in any arsenal could have achieved this result. The submarine pen attacks revealed both capabilities and limitations. At Brest on August 5, 1944, six tallboys penetrated concrete roofs between 3.6 and 6.2 metres thick, the first significant damage after more than 80 previous raids. At Bergen on January 12, 1945, three bombs punched through the 11-foot roof, destroying workshops and storage facilities inside. Four Lancasters were lost to anti-aircraft fire, but at Lorient, the complete Fangross defence system stopped penetration entirely. The K-3 bunker's 25-foot layered roof withstood the attack. La Palace similarly resisted. Six direct hits destroyed the Fangrost sacrificial layer but could not breach the main structure beneath. Post-war British analysis noted that the Tallboy was discovered to be too small to destroy concrete buildings with direct hits. Only near misses which opened a camouflet under the foundations proved effective against the heaviest fortifications. For those targets, Britain developed the 22,000-pound Grand Slam, Tallboy's larger sibling, which entered service in March 1945. Neither Germany nor the United States developed equivalent weapons during the war. Among the largest bombs the Luftwaffe fielded operationally, the SC-2500 weighed only 5,500 pounds. Their strategic focus went toward guided weapons like the Fritz X rather than seismic destruction. American bombers could not carry Tallboy-class weapons until late war B-29 modifications, and by then atomic weapons made conventional penetrators seem redundant for strategic purposes. The American T-10, later designated M121, was a license-built Tallboy variant that arrived too late for service in Europe. It saw action in Korea as the radio-guided Tarzan bomb and reappeared in Vietnam. The T-12 Cloudmaker, a direct descendant weighing 43,600 pounds, could penetrate 120 feet of earth and 29 feet of concrete, but only 57 were ever manufactured before nuclear weapons eliminated demand for conventional bunker busters. Modern weapons confirm Wallace's principles remain valid. When coalition forces faced hardened Iraqi bunkers during the 1991 Gulf War, engineers developed the GBU-28 in three weeks, a 5,000-pound penetrator following Tallboy's fundamental design philosophy. Today's massive ordnance penetrator, at 30,000 pounds and designed for deeply buried nuclear facilities, represents a direct conceptual descendant. Young's penetration equation used to calculate depth for contemporary bunker busters, incorporates data derived from Tallboy crater analysis conducted over 80 years ago. Between June 1944 and April 1945, RAF records indicate 854 Tallboys were dropped operationally. They sank the most powerful battleship in the German fleet. They collapsed V-weapon bunkers that threatened to rain terror on British cities. They destroyed railway tunnels, viaducts and bridges that conventional bombs could not touch. They achieved this not through brute explosive force, but through precise application of physics, attacking foundations rather than surfaces, using the earth itself as a weapon. The bomb that fell on Saumur that June night embodied everything British engineering achieved under pressure. When the Air Ministry said earthquake bombs were impossible, Wallace proved them wrong. When Harris called his ideas fantasy, Wallace delivered results. When Germany built structures designed to survive anything the Allies could drop on them, British engineers found a way to make those structures destroy themselves. Tirpitz lies capsized in Norwegian waters to this day, a monument to what conventional thinking could not accomplish and unconventional British engineering could. The earthquake bomb worked, the numbers proved it, the wreckage confirmed it, and the legacy continues in every bunker buster that follows Wallace's principles, attacking from below what cannot be broken from above. British engineering was not luck. It was innovation under pressure, producing weapons that worked when nothing else could. That is what the Tallboy proved, one collapsing bunker at a time.